So the acronym at last. For all the ground search and rescue types out there, you'll recognize the acronym LAST. Locate, access, stabilize, and transport. This works in confined spaces. When we show up to a confined space, it's not like a high angle incident. The patient isn't obvious to us. They're not hanging off the side of a building, for instance. We may actually have to go and find them. We've added AT, A-T, to make AT LAST for confined space rescue. The A being atmosphere. We spoke briefly about that trifecta, the geography of the space we're entering, patient considerations, and back to the first module we spoke about, atmosphere. That atmosphere is going to create a lot of decision points for us. If the atmosphere is bad, where we rig, what we wear, what considerations we have for the patient is much different than if the atmosphere is good. So as a confined space rescuer, we need to take a look at that. Time, the T in at last, the first T. Time plays a critical factor in confined space, especially if the atmosphere is compromised. This starts to bring up that uncomfortable conversation of, if the atmosphere is compromised and our patient is dead because the time has elapsed to the point where we cannot rescue them, why are we risking people? We may be better off backing out, ventilating, no matter how long that takes, and then carrying out the recovery at a later time. This is not like our high angle scenario. There's gonna be news cameras hanging around, but we're not gonna see John P. Victim hanging on the news. They're usually in a hole and they're usually out of the viewer's eye. This allows us some time in order to deal with some of these issues if they arise. This breaks us now into the regular LAST acronym. Unlike our traditional high angle rescue or even a trench rescue, we don't know whereabouts in the space a lot of times our victim is. Sure, we might get lucky. Somebody there may know where they are. Somebody may know where they're working. Perhaps they're on a lifeline and we can follow that breadcrumb in. However, if not, we're gonna have to kit and send in a recce team to go and find that patient or those patients in that space. The other concern we have here is if the atmosphere is bad, we may have multiple patients in multiple locations. So this is an important factor in locating that person or those people. The A in at last, access. How are we gonna get our rescuers in there and you might think, well, isn't locate and access the same thing? Well, we could go into a space, and we've been in spaces, where we could have someone in a fall protection harness hanging inside the confined space. Great, we've located them under L, but we need to now access them under A. If we're lucky, the patient's lying on the ground, supine, ready to go. That seldom happens with confined space rescue. This brings us into our S, the stabilize. Once again, that trifecta comes into play here. Atmosphere, are we bringing air in for our patient? Is our patient dead and this is a recovery? Does a patient have his own or her own air in there that we need to supplement? When we package this patient, geographically speaking, are we gonna have to bend them to get them out? Is this space small? Are we gonna be able to put them into the stokes? Or are we gonna to have to put them in a webbing harness? We'll talk a lot more about patient considerations in the last module of this program. And then last but not least, we hit transport. Transport is the actual rope rescue of confined space rescue. This is where we're gonna start looking at our rescue rigging. Are we gonna do a tripod re? Are we looking at a split four to one? Do we have to cross haul them across a pit or some sort of void inside of that space. That transport decision is what's gonna drive your rigging decisions. We'll demonstrate the application of the at last confined space rescue planning acronym. The assessment of the space indicated an IDLH atmosphere was present. And after considering the amount of time that the patient was potentially exposed to that atmosphere, it was determined that a rescue was still viable. 
Therefore, our rescuers are entering the space wearing supplied air respirators. In addition to the equipment they may need to access and possibly extricate the patient, they'll also bring in a supplied air respirator system for the patient to provide him with clean, respirable air. At this point, the rescuers begin their search of the space in order to locate the patient. One of the pieces of equipment the rescuers have brought with them is a bash kit. A bash kit is an internal rigging kit usually made up of smaller diameter rope and some uh, smaller pieces of equipment designed specifically for use inside the space to be small and maneuverable and generally only intended for one person on the system. Here rescuer two is preparing to uh, place a rope from the bash kit onto rescuer one to assist him as he descends this incline tube to access the patient. Here we can see one of the issues in um, particularly IDLH confined space rescue, that of line management. The amount of ropes and um, air lines and communication lines within the confines of the space demands that constant housekeeping and attention to make sure that these lines don't become tangled, air lines don't become pinched uh, or equipment compromised. Here, Rescue 2 is preparing to assist Rescue 1 with assisting in raising the patient out of this inclined tube within the confined space. Convoluted confined spaces may require internal rigging to extricate the patient. This rigging may be anchored to some structure within the space. It may be anchored to a rope that is anchored outside of the space, or in this case, it's anchored directly to one of the rescuer's harnesses itself. The patient has been fitted with a supplied air respirator. When conducting rescues in IDLH environments, you must provide clean, respirable air for both rescuers and any patients that are inside the space. As we look at our AT LAST acronym, there are some considerations that we need to take into account. In confined space rescue, we primarily want to look at three types of rescue. Self-rescue, external rescue, and internal rescue, and in that order. If we show up on scene and the person can self-rescue, that's what we want to start with. In our world, that is highly unlikely. No one's going to be calling for a rescue team if they can get out of the space on their own. It is possible that we could show up and do an external rescue. Perhaps we have to lower down a lifeline for them to clip into. Perhaps we just need to assist in some way externally and not entering the space. Perhaps we can use a stick clip, reach down and clip into a dorsal D. This is safer for our members to do it externally than having them enter the hazardous location that caused the incident to occur. Last but not least, and the primary thing that we're looking at is an internal rescue. Once that decision point is made that we're going internal, we have to look at that big A word again, atmosphere. We harped on it all through the first segment of this program. We talked about it in At Last and we're looking at it again. If the atmosphere is good, we can send our teams in clean. And this is what we would rather do. It increases comms. We're not hauling air around. We're not bringing air for our patient. It makes our rescue easier.
If the atmosphere is bad or unknown, i.e. we're sending our recce team somewhere that we can't monitor, then we have to make the assumption that it's bad and we have to put them on air, which leads us to our next decision point. Are we going SCBA, self-contained breathing apparatus, or SAR, supplied air respirator? We look at approximately a 24 inch diameter. If it's 24 inches, two feet or larger, we can generally get into the space with SCBA. If we have to remove the SCBA, because we're a larger rescuer, on the entry or the exit, we need to move to supplied air respirator. So don't take your 24 inches as gospel. It is a good standard, however. If we're less than 24 inches or we're a larger rescuer, then we're gonna have to look at a supplied air respirator to get into the space. This brings in extra complications of air hose lines, of communication lines that we're dragging through the space with us. From here, there are a few other considerations that we're gonna to briefly touch on that'll come up again during the rigging and the patient components of the program. Our recce team, for our American viewers, our recon team. When we use this term, we're talking primarily of a two-person team, one person being a medic, carrying a medic bag, and one person being a rigger, carrying a rig bag, or if we want to move into the caving world, a bash kit. We also have secondary rigging teams. We may have teams internal in the space rigging geographically technical terrain inside of the space that is remote from our initial access point. In cavers, they call these bash teams. We can use that term or we can use the term rigging teams. Now these rigging teams or bash teams are not going in with full 12 and a half, 11.1 millimeter ropes. A lot of times they're moving in with smaller, lighter equipment to do that rigging. We'll go into more of that a little bit later. As well, like any IDLH atmosphere, if we're sending people in, we need to be able to rescue the rescuers. If you're working with a fire service, this is generally gonna be considered your two in, two out rule. If you're an industrial team, almost every regulation out there in the first world indicates that if you put two people in, you have to have at least one person out still to rescue the rescuer. So your rapid intervention team, RIT, or rapid intervention crew, your RIC, needs to be established in place and in the same PPE as your entrance going in. Finally, plan A's and plan B's. There's a saying out there, I don't remember where it comes from, that the first plan never survives enemy contact. Imagine your confined space or any rescue in that situation. Once they get in and decide, hey, we have to turn left instead of right to get to our patient. Hey, we have two patients, not one. Your plan A now becomes your plan B. You better have had it decided on before you sent them in. And once you get into plan B, you better be looking at your plan C. Your rescuers, your patients, they deserve nothing less.